Pope Francis' new apostolic exhortation, Rejoice and Be Glad, contains some powerful thoughts on the call to holiness with a few clear shots at his critics. What is his ultimate message and does it bring clarity out of the confusion that seems to have engulfed the church? The papal posse, Robert Royal and Father Gerald Murray, will join us with analysis. And later, are romance and courtship dead? How are young people connecting with each other in today's chaotic culture? Dr. Carrie Cronin of Boston College is here to talk about how she's challenging her students and the new film, Capturing It All, The Dating Project, the world over, begins right now. Now, from Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. An important show for you tonight. The Papal Posse, Robert Royal and Father Gerald Murray are here, as is Dr. Carrie Cronin. Complete analysis of that new papal teaching document on holiness is coming up. And if you'd like to comment on tonight's show, send me a tweet. I'm at Raymond Arroyo. You can email me at worldover at EWTN.com, but Twitter is always better. Now some news. A leading cardinal appears to be claiming that the church could consider and approve the priestly ordination of women. Vienna Archbishop Christoph Schonborn, whom Pope Francis entrusted with the public rollout of Amoris Laetitia, said in a recent interview that the question of female ordination can, quote, only be clarified by a council and cannot be decided upon by a pope alone. He told Austrian journalists that the question is too big to be decided from the desk of a pope. Cardinal Schoenborn's comment implicitly, if not explicitly, rejects Pope St. John Paul II's 1994 declaration on the matter in an apostolic letter where he wrote, I declare that the church has no authority whatsoever to confer priestly ordination on women and that this judgment is to be definitively held by all the church's faithful. Back in Rome this week, the Pontifical Commission for Latin America has called for a new synod of bishops on the theme of women in the life and mission of the church. And mass attendance is continuing to fall among American Catholics and has hit an historic low. For the first time since Gallup began tracking the habits of the faithful more than 60 years ago, Fewer than 4 in 10 Catholics, only 39% attend Mass any given Sunday. That's down from 45% 10 years ago. In 1955, that number was 75%. Moreover, for the first time, Catholics are going to church less than other Christian denominations. About 45% of Protestants attend church weekly. Catholic numbers are being dragged down by two age groups. Only one in four young adults ages 21 to 29 are attending Mass, and perhaps surprisingly, those brought up in the years immediately following the reforms of Vatican II, ages 50 to 59, are attending Mass just 31% of the time any given week. Seniors, Gen Xers, and Millennials are all attending Mass in the 40 to 49% range. One other interesting note from Gallup, the loss of faith is apparent across religions in America, a little more than 20% of adults brought up Catholic, Hindu, Jewish, or Muslim have left the faith of their childhood. Here with analysis of this new papal exhortation, Rejoice and Be Glad, is the Papal Posse. Editor-in-Chief of the CatholicThing.org, Robert Royal, and from Manhattan, canon lawyer and priest of the Archdiocese of New York, Father Gerald Murray, gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Uh, I want to jump right in. On Wednesday, it was publicized that the Pope had sent a letter to the Chilean bishops. Uh, in it, he admits he made grave errors of judgment in Chile's sex abuse scandal and invited the abuse victims he had discredited to Rome to beg their forgiveness. In the letter, he wrote, I have fallen into serious mistakes of judgment and understanding of the situation, especially due to a lack of truthful and balanced information. Now I ask pardon of all those that I have offended, and I hope to be able to do so personally in the coming weeks. Now, here's my question. If indeed there was a breakdown of truthful and balanced information, what is the source of this? Robert Royal. 
Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think that's a good statement that he put out there. It's, it's tough to admit you made a mistake on a very serious issue like this, and he took full responsibility for it. However, the question now is, what was the process? You know, what, 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 where was the breakdown? Now, many people say that Cardinal Erasuriz from Chile, who he's, he's very close with, mm -hmm. and is on the cardinal, that, that uh, committee of nine cardinals nine cardinal. that advise him, was primarily the conduit of the information. And if that's true, of course, that presents a problem. But I would take this one step further, and I would say if I were the Holy Father, because this is a very important issue, not only inside the church, for, but for people outside the church. Right. I think he needs to, to review the process of where he's getting information from. Because, you know, in Italy, they have a joke, they mention this all the time, that it's the circolo magico, the, the magic circle around him mm. manipulates whatever information that he, he's getting mm -hmm. on particular issues. And we see it very pointedly here. When he was warned, when there were massive protests, right. he spoke re very sharply back to the people who were accusing this bishop, Baros, and almost accused them of being stupid. In fact, did. He called them tontos. He said, you're stupid. You need right. this calumny. You need evidence for this. And in fact, he was getting the wrong information. So I think he's got to undertake a thorough review of the process by which he's receiving information on these very serious issues mm -hmm. like this. Father Jerry, uh, you'll remember how vociferously the Pope wagged his finger at those who were trying to get his attention at the rope line in Chile to, to get him to react because he had appointed this Bishop Juan Barros in Chile, who these victims claim was a witness to their abuse at the hands of this Father Calamara. Uh, your thoughts on what this means and why do you think the Pope is coming out with this letter now, begging forgiveness? Well, I think he realized after being in Chile that he had to act on this, that it was the topic that dominated the headlines while he was down there. Uh, my question is, uh, when is Bishop Barros going to be removed? Uh, there's nothing about that in the letter. And I also agree with Bob, there has to be a review because he said he was lacking truthful and balanced information. So either things were being kept from him or he was being given untruthful and unbalanced information. Uh, the process uh, canonically has to be laid out clearly what happens when a bishop is accused of having mm -hmm. participated in the sexual abuse of minors. Uh, that's clear with priests, so we know what happens. With bishops, it's a little more mysterious and right now, I think that's an area that needs to be firmed up in canon law. And the fact is, the Pope made this man a bishop, nonetheless. So we'll wrap up on this topic, Bob. Yeah, I, I also think we need to look more carefully at the committee in, in Rome that has been tasked with dealing with this problem of abuse. Because we know that Cardinal O'Malley personally, who was the head of that committee, right. personally handled, ha handed a letter from those victims to the Holy Father some months ago. Yeah, we interviewed one of them, right. Juan Carlos. Yeah. And Therefore, so the Pope gets a lot of things yeah. handed to him, and now it's easy, he could have mislaid it. But when your own cardinal, who's the head of an important commission, hands you something, I think you either have to read it yourself, pass it to somebody that's going to make something happen. And then on top of this, as we know, regrettably, that committee was allowed to lapse almost simultaneous with, with this controversy. So there's a lot of structural re-examination that needs to go on here, and probably not only on this subject. Mm -hmm. I want to move on to the apostolic exhortation, the big papal news of the week. It was released on Monday, and it calls all people to holiness. It reiterates and reinforces some of the Church's core beliefs about holiness, sanctity, and the spiritual life, while also seeming to take aim at some of the Pope's critics in the Church. He clearly states, Holiness is experiencing, in union with Christ, the mysteries of his life. It consists of uniting ourselves to the Lord's death and resurrection in a unique and personal way, constantly dying and rising anew with him. The Lord asks everything of us, and in return, he offers us true life, the happiness for which we were created. He wants us to be saints and not settle for a bland and mediocre existence. Your take on this Give us the flyover on this exhortation, and then we'll dive into some other particular moments. It is, uh, and it's called Rejoice and Be Glad. It's to focus everyone on sanctity, holiness. Your thoughts. I wrote a column uh, this week on this at the, the Catholic thing in which I regretted that because of the divisions that have gotten even worse uh, under this papacy, when he puts out a document that's largely good like this, we can't read it without suspicions or that we can't read it without controversy. And why arising. is that? 
Well, because people, one set of people read it one way and one set of people read it, read it another. Yeah. Two of my readers wrote to me and said, you know, you're the one exacerbating all these differences in the yeah. church as yeah. if somehow we, we created this, yeah. this large scale international uh, controversy. On the other hand, other people are writing me and saying you were too, cha perhaps too charitable toward uh. him. You know, you tried to say that there were good things in here. So you must the, be looking into my mailbox. <laughs> I get this every week. Well, the, well, you know, don't shoot the messenger. I'm not the pope. All we do is cover this. I do think people sometimes look. We all love the Holy Father. I think the viewers of this program do. You, st it is up to us to respect him enough to take the words and evaluate them in a context of the times and of the moment. And if we look the other way for portions or pretend we're not seeing it, we're letting that audience down and we're not being, to my mind, good Catholics. So I'm sorry to interrupt. You well, I mean, you get, you get the point that I'm trying to yeah. make is that whether we like it or not right now at this point because of the divisions in the church. And by the way, just today there was announced that Georgetown is going to have a conference next month about overcoming divisions in the church, at which Cardinal Supich and Archbishop Gomez from Los Angeles mm -hmm. are going to be featured on a, on a program with various other people as well. So it's not as if EWTN or the Catholic thing or you know some obscure theologians have decided that they have a, a, a bone to pick with Holy Father. There is a serious division now, mm -hmm. and it comes to the fore even when he's trying to deal with a relatively non-controversial subject mm -hmm. like holiness. Yeah. Father Jerry, um, to my mind when I read it, there are only wonderful uh, insights here and kind of uh, it, it, parts of it almost remi reminded me of Mother Angelica's spirituality. Very practical at moments. He uses the Beatitudes to illustrate, you know, how to be holy, and he clearly states our mission in Christ. Your impression overall of this uh, apostolic exhortation? Well, I enjoyed the parts that dealt with the supernatural life that, uh, in fact, our mission is not simply to be a, a worldly uh, provider of goods, you know, are, are in the church. We're not just there to console people with charity. We're there to bring them to love God. And we have to do that. We have to love God ourselves. And that the love of God is, in the first place, a gift of His grace that we respond to. So that part I liked. But I got to the sections where the Pope deals with what he calls Neo-Pelagianism, mm -hmm. and uh, I just said to myself, wait a minute, what's going on here? Then there's another section on Neo-Gnosticism, and as I think you know, we'll discuss right now, yeah. uh, these are, in my, in my opinion, very serious problems in this document because he seems to be uh, defending uh, the controversial parts of Amoris Laetitiae by lashing out at people that don't agree with him. And I find mm -hmm. that very, very troubling. Well, let me read that. Let me read that section to you and then get your commentary on it. Um, this is what the Pope says. Not infrequently, contrary to the promptings of the Spirit, the life of the church can become a museum piece or a possession of a select few. This can occur when some groups of Christians give excessive importance to certain rules, customs, or ways of acting. The gospel then tends to be reduced and constricted, deprived of its simplicity, allure, and savor. This may well be a subtle form of Pelagianism for it appears to subject the life of grace to certain human structures only to end up fossilized and corrupt. Who do you think he's talking about there, Father Jerry? It seems to me he's talking about those who object to uh, what he wrote in the uh, eighth chapter of Morris Laetitia, where he's saying in some cases people who are in invalid second marriages can be given Holy Communion while remaining in those adulterous unions. And for me, uh, it, there's nothing, you cannot ca categorize obedience to the Ten Commandments as a defect. And it is not a museum to say that what Christ said 2,000 years ago is what I believe today. In fact, human structures are not the matter here when it comes to the sacramental life of the church. The church has taught solemnly that the seven sacraments were given to us by Christ. So was the moral law, so is the natural law, that's part of God's creation. So. Uh, when I hear the Pope more or less stigmatizing people who say, why are we changing what St. John Paul II told us to do, uh, that's not the way we should be doing things. If there are legitimate reasons why the Pope thinks his point of view about giving communion to the divorce and remarry can be defended on the basis of Catholic doctrine and tradition, state them so that we can have a dialogue. This seems to be a d discussion ender where he basically with invective, stigmatizes those who don't agree with him. Mm. And as you say, we love the Pope. I respect and love the Pope, pray for him all the time. 
But I think honesty, we have to say, Holy Father, when we think you've made a mistake, uh, charity demands we tell you that. Mm -hmm. and, and I think the sex abuse uh, situation is a good example where n not only we called attention to this, but the New York Times, Time Magazine, and you saw the reaction. The Pope looked at this anew, realized he had gone off course, and now he's, he's correcting himself. Uh, let's talk here about the rigidity, when he talks about rigidity of these structures, as you raised in your piece, are Catholic universities, social service groups, are they rigid, fossilized? Is that who he's talking about? Yeah, see, what I was trying to get at with that particular part of the column is I agree entirely with Father that um, this seems to be a self-defense. Mm. And the odd thing about it, quite apart from the problems, the philosophical and theological problems, both the, the, the Gnostic and the, the Pelagian sections, I think, are very, very poorly written, and they're not really first-rate thinking on the, these subjects. Mm. But quite apart from that, if we step back from it for just a second, we look around the world, and I'm sure all of us visit various countries in the world, is it true that at this moment in the history of the Catholic Church that the problem is rigidity? I, I think it's exactly the opposite, in mm. fact. I mean, we've got scores of, of colleges and universities that churn out students who've maybe gone to Catholic schools their whole lives, have gone through four years of college, and know virtually nothing about the faith, and therefore respect very little in terms of rules about marriage or confession, go to, com to, to, uh, to uh, com communion. Um, it's, it seems on the large scale that it's the exact opposite of what he's trying to present. Maybe in the past at some point there was this rigidity. When, 1940? In, in Argentina, but certainly now. And this is not even a Catholic thing. If you look around the secular world, people talk about we're living in a world that is post-truth. Right. You know, we're living in a world that is utterly chaotic, that has no fixed principles. So, as I said in the column, to want to hold on to some fundamental Catholic dogmas is not to be rigid. It's to be sane, to, to seek sanity in an utter chaos of the modern world. I, I want to move on. There was a, uh, the Pope at one point uh, during the Chrism Mass, mentioned something that I want to bring to your attention. He said this during his homily. We must be careful not to fall into the temptation of making idols of certain abstract truths. I think this speaks to what we're talking about here. They can be comfortable idols, always within easy reach. They offer certain prestige and power and are difficult to discern. Because the truth idol imitates, it dresses itself up in the words of the gospel, but does not let those words touch the heart. Much worse, it distances ordinary people from the healing closeness of the word and the sacraments of Jesus. Father Jerry, your reaction to that? Can truth be an idol? Well, when I read that, I was pretty, yeah, I was pretty shocked because tr truth is not an idol. In fact, to, uh, to call abstract truth, which basically means doctrines which are written down on paper, uh, you can't touch a doctrine, but you can think about it and, and, and it has the force of the truth because it's revealed by God or it's part of the natural law. Uh, when I read that the Pope was saying you can make that into an idol, I was very stunned because the, the truth is the remedy to idolatry. Let's not forget that in the world of paganism before the coming of Christ, uh, immorality and evil were the result of people erring because they didn't know the truth. Mm -hmm. When Christ brought the truth, fulfillment of the hope of Israel, the light of the world suddenly shone on the whole world and this is what we have now. We have Christianity with a definite body of teaching and doctrine and we believe it fully. Um, this very, very troubling and I would say to the Holy Father, the problem in the modern world is not that people think that the truth is an idol, they just don't care about the truth because it's not being defended properly. Mm. And that's our goal. We've got to tell people, look, here's the truth, mm -hmm. we're going to defend it against error, and we're going to make sure that society understands. If you don't live by the truth, the alternative is a dictatorship, the alternative is chaos, communism, Nazism, whatever you want to look at historically. No truth, it basically comes down to who has the biggest stick and who kills most enemies. That's not mm. the way justice is achieved in society. Mm. Yeah, well, I, I had letters from people who are not, certainly not churched people, who read that and said, I, I agree with the Pope. This is, you know, this is a, there's a big truth idol in all these uh, organized religions. You know, I'm the, I'm the person who's out here discerning my truth, and that's what we have to live. You would say what? Well, I mean, that's the whole problem of the modern world. Look, the, the basic 
bet the backdrop of the modern world is a dead scientific materialism mm. in which there are no values instantiated in the world. There is no God. We'll all make up our own truth. And that starts to bleed all, over into the, the, the church itself. Now, look, if the pope wants to say that certain priests and bishops are too hard line, they, there may be some somewhere. I have to mm -hmm. say I don't really see that that's the case. Mm -hmm. But I would actually like to see a greater emphasis on the right uses, uses of the truth, mm -hmm. that we begin to introduce people into why it is that this will make your life happier. We have tremendous sociological data that shows that people who are in stable marriages, who stay married, have children, you know, carry out all those, those normal functions that used to be part of human life, that the, the people who do that live well, are happier than their counterparts in, in the modern world. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the, the world that we're in right now, I mean, you see a country like Italy. Whoever thought Italy could be a country without children? Whoever thought that the West and in general would be involved in the kind of cultural of death where it's not reproducing itself? So there's, there's something that has to be fought here. And I have to say, overall, since the very beginning, the Pope has not really wanted to, to, to argue these things. He kind of walks away from from, from these, uh, these questions about truth and dogma, because they're hard. And we understand he's trying to invite people in, but the, the, we cannot lose this. Otherwise, we have nothing to offer people. Mm -hmm. Something else I want to point out to you both. In the exhortation, Pope Francis seems to equate the pro-life cause with caring for migrants. He puts them on the same plane. Look at this. Some Catholics affirm that it is a secondary issue with respect to the serious issues of bioethics. Our defense of the innocent unborn, for example, needs to be clear, firm, and passionate. Equally sacred, however, are the lives of the poor, those already born, the destitute, the abandoned. Father Jerry, there doesn't seem to be a problem there. I mean, all he's saying is all human life is of worth. What's the difficulty here? I've seen a lot of articles and, and people grinding their teeth over this. Well, the way it's been understood, and I think it's not unfair, is that he's equating uh, the effort of the church to stop abortion with the effort of the church to help migrants. And, you know, I don't think that's uh, a proper analysis of the situation. You know, 3,000 children a day are aborted in the United States. 3,000 migrants aren't being killed or imprisoned. Uh, so, therefore, there's a complete magnitude of difference between how we help people who are basically you know, violating the law, becoming illegally, but on the other hand, we want to be charitable and figure out a solution to the fact that the government is uh, protecting doctors who kill babies in their mother's womb and in some states pay for it. I mean, the, the outrage, you know, talks that Pope says it has to be passionate about the pro-life movement. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we need some passion from all sectors of the church on this matter. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm so proud of our bishops in the United States who do not let this issue die. Mm -hmm. But I don't see very much pro-life fervor in a lot of European countries. Mm -hmm. And I think the Pope should put, you know, light a fire under them about that. Mm -hmm. Is this the return of the seamless garment championed and advanced by Cardinal Joseph Bernadine that many of us, frankly, thought with John Paul and Benedict had been dispensed with, this idea that all these issues occupy the same moral plane? At least in this country, I think one of the underlying problems w when we read something like that is that that argument has been used for years by the Democratic Party to basically do nothing. Mm -hmm. And in fact, to continue to support and, and, and foster uh, an abortion culture in the United States. So mm -hmm. by putting those things on an equal plane, it really it reduces the urgency of dealing with, uh, with abortion, which, as Father was saying, is, is ongoing murder of human beings on a daily basis, just reduces it to another political issue. I'm quite willing to admit that migrants, true refugees, not, ju not just mm -hmm. you know, people who claim to be refugees, right. do have a moral claim on us. But those things are prudential judgments. If we look to Europe, if we look to the United States, to, to, to Mexico, people are very nervous about um, refugees appearing on their doorstep, immigrants trying to enter illegally when they are very hard to, to assimilate. In a country like Italy, where thousands of people arrive from North Africa uh, every week, right. they have a 50 percent youth unemployment rate. So in a country like that, where you're trying to prop up young people, prop up the family, encourage people to have children of their own, these are, are judgments that have to be weighed against who you're going to admit to your country. And right now, the European Union is not doing a very good job with this. Mm -hmm. So. That's why we call this prudential. There are complicated things. In the, the case of abortion, we just have to stop 
the murder of children in the womb. You want to help out women who are in difficult circumstances, fine, that's another question. But we're talking about the destruction of human innocent life, which has always been prohibited by Catholic moral thought. I want to try to get to two quick other segments here of this exhortation. One involves the Pope mentioning very clearly here the dangers and ways of the devil and how he is to be avoided. He's clear that that is an individual person moving through the world. This seems at odds with that Scalfari interview a few weeks ago where, according to Scalfari, the Pope said hell does not exist. Father Jerry, your thought on what we're hearing now as opposed to the Scalfari report and the non-clarity the non coming out of the Vatican uh, media apparatus on this. Yeah, let me say that the Scalfari interview where he claims that the Pope said the hell doesn't exist and that those who are damned, uh, their souls go out of existence, uh, this is a very serious matter because Scalfari is not a guy who stumbled in off the street and then making claims uh, based on not having talked to the Pope. He was invited by the Pope for the fifth time. He's done this in the past where he composes stories about what the Pope has said. Mm -hmm. uh, the denial from the Holy See was basically a journalistic note saying you can't trust that every word which is in the quotation marks is an actual reproduction of what the Pope said. Right. Well, that's true, but there's a more basic question. Was the substance reported by Scofari the substance of what the Pope said? I use an analogy. It's, it's a little bit shocking, but let's say the Pope had, had gotten, had, had, the Scofari said, Pope Francis told me that Nazi racial theory was actually part of the Christian worldview uh, and that we have to relook at it. Do um, you think the Holy See would have taken that sitting down and simply said, well, don't trust that the words and the quotes are, are accurate mm -hmm. reflection? Mm -hmm. They would have denied it outright. And of course, Nazi mm -hmm. theory is horrendous, but so is the idea that there's no hell. That is a direct contradiction of Catholic truth. It's in the Bible. The Lord spoke about it many times. And as people have pointed out, if there is no hell, then what did Jesus save us from? Yeah. So I think with the Holy Father, I hope and pray, and I'm glad he talked about the devil. Yeah, in the exhortation, but let's have there. a little more clear exposition that what Scalfari said is wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to put another, you, do you want to weigh in on this quickly? Well, I just would, would add that this isn't the first time that Scalfari claims that the Pope has said that, an, that right. annihilation occurs. In, in 2015. There, there have been several it. instances of this, and either this is a fixation of Scalfari's or in some fashion the Holy Father is, is playing some kind of And I of have to say, shot. the exhortation sounds a lot more like Francis. If you read his daily homilies, he's always talking about the devil's yes, here, no, the absolutely. devil's there, the devil's absolutely. here, the Lord of this world. I mean, he's always been clear on this. So, it, again, that dissidence doesn't help anybody. Well, I, I would also point out that it took a long time for them to respond. It, it took almost a whole day in Rome for them to respond to this. And there are stories that a highly placed cardinal, not an Italian, uh, together with other cardinals in whose name he spoke called the Holy Father and said you've got to respond to this because mm -hmm. this is a disaster. Oh, it, was a, it was a train wreck. Um, very quickly I want to get to this question of contemplation. The contemplative tradition in, in the Western Church is rich and deep and yet this is what Pope Francis writes in this exhortation. We'll close with this. He says, it is not healthy to love silence while fleeing interaction with others, to want peace and quiet while avoiding activity, to seek prayer while disdaining service. Everything can be accepted and integrated into our lives in this world and become a part of our path to holiness. Now, Father Spadaro, the Pope's um, pal who ghostwrites a lot of his columns, may have ghostwritten this exhortation to some extent, has come out and said that refers to, uh, you know, this notion that God, God or nothing is ridiculous and, uh, you know, pr silence being the, the, the thing we have to seek is, you know, not absolute kind of a side swipe at Cardinal Sarah, who had two books similarly titled. Your reaction to what we heard there? What yeah, is this? Well, again, to put this in the larger context, is there too much contemplation in the church or in the world? I mean, at this point in history, we've lost this. And I, I was very glad to see the, the Holy Father quote John of the Cross, Teresa of Avila, mm -hmm. of, Teresa of, of the uh, Child yep. Jesus, because that's our wonderful contemplative tradition. I would actually argue the opposite. I mean, I think there are an awful lot of young people and not so young people in the Western world who turn to Buddhism and yoga and Hinduism because they are looking for a spirituality that is not just a spirituality of the everyday, but it's a spirituality that goes deeper, that, that really reaches those mm -hmm. parts of our personality that are, are mostly 
you know, not on, on display right. on a daily basis. So if we were to bring forward what our contemplative tradition is, which d doesn't mean having to neglect and ignore people, people yeah. you know, and, and, and whatnot. If we were to bring that forward, there's a whole segment, I think, of, of young people in the modern world who would pay attention because it would show that the Catholic tradition has something to offer, something mm -hmm. that the world doesn't have to offer, something that the other religions do not Yeah, offer. Father Jerry, two of the greatest contemplatives I know, knew and met were Mother Angelica and John Paul II. They were hardly shrinking violets who stayed in the room all day. Um, but is this, as some have written, a condemnation or dismissal of uh, mysticism and the contemplative tradition in the church by the Pope? I don't think so. I don't think the Pope would ever do that, but I think he's underestimating that uh, prayer is a form of service. And in fact, the prayers offered by the contemplatives are like the uh, powerhouse that generates, you know, this overflow of grace, which mm -hmm. allows other people to do good works. So and I, th there's an antagonism uh, sometimes here in what the Pope says to people who uh, you know, are not out there with the smell of the sheep kind of image. You've got to go out there, walk in the slums. Uh, well, yes, people have to do that, but not everybody. I think the contemplative Carmelites who are praying for the people in the slums uh, make possible the good work that others will do. So I wish he had drawn that connection. I'm sure he would agree with that. It was you know, not artfully stated. Mm -hmm. Finally, this commission, a pontifical commission for Latin America, has proposed that Pope Francis convene a synod on the role of women in the life and mission of the church. Um, I want to give each of you a minute to react to that. Is, are, it seems we have synod fever these days. There's the young people synod, the Amazon synod, now the woman synod being proposed. Uh, what's going on here? Is this needed? I don't know. They're asking the Pope to, to uh, organize this synod. I have a feeling they were asked to ask him, is mm -hmm. the way I would, I would put this. Um, I'm very worried about all these synods now because we've seen that I was at the, the Youth Synod, of course, mm -hmm. several weeks ago, and yet again, like the synods on the family, it starts out in a very good direction, you know, building up the family, engaging young people, you know, dealing with women, whatever it might be. However, we just know that there are a lot of forces in the modern world that look at events like this as an opportunity to put, to put something um, together quite different than the Catholic tradition. And I have a mm -hmm. feeling, it's only a feeling, but... Um, because of these divisions, as I said earlier, because of the kinds of things that we're suspicious about, even in, in otherwise innocent contexts. Well, because of the two synods on yeah. the family I that think, ended up with a Morris Laetitia. I, I think we're likely to see this go in a direction that is going to be bothersome. Father Jerry, your reaction also, you, you saw um, Cardinal Schoenborn, which we reported earlier, coming out and telling a group of uh, journalists that the ordination of women is a question that could be decided by a council, opening the door, it seems, to uh, this question. You know, this is an earthquake this past week of bad ideas, and that's one of the worst things I've heard lately. Uh, Cardinal Schoenborn was the principal author of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, in which he accurately and faithfully re uh, responded to this question by saying that the church judged it to be impossible to ordain women because the will of Christ was manifested that he only chose men. Uh, for Cardinal Schoenborn to say that the Pope alone can't decide it, the council could, this is a decided matter. Now back to the other question about a synod on women. Mm -hmm. For me, this is pandering to secular uh, worldview, which basically says if a woman can't do everything else that a man can do, then she's being treated unfairly. Well, in that case, the problem starts with Adam and Eve, because God made us different, and each has its vocation. Jesus Christ only chose men to be ordained ministers in his church. Let's be clear about that. That was not an arbitrary decision. That was a divine decision. By definition, all divine decisions are good and holy. I know of no real problem, and this is my uh, observation, no real problem in the life of the church because women feel that they are separated from God by the existing way the church is. I think there's a bunch of unhappy women, feminists and their allies, who are basically trying to do a takeover move on the hierarchy and say, we have to be priests, we have to be bishops, otherwise you are not being fair and godlike. No. You do not contradict Jesus Christ's will in the name of trying to put into effect what you think Jesus Christ would have done. We know what he did. So let's, be, let's just be clear here. Manipulation of opinion by, you know, synod organizations, you know, we got to have a synod on this, a synod on mm -hmm. that. No. Why don't we just sit down and read the gospel and read existing Catholic doctrine and say, where do we all fit into this? For me, mm -hmm. the happiest people in the world are like Mother Angelica and Mother Teresa. 
They had so much authentic power because of love and grace. The fact they couldn't celebrate mass or, or you know, sit in a bishop's chair, that's irrelevant. That's you know, not that, how... That, in, the frankly, church is about holiness, as the Pope told us. Frankly, the two women you just mentioned would make bishops and did make bishops tremble, and they had more influence than any bishop I've ever met, that's for sure. Father Jerry, we'll leave it right there. Robert Royal, thank you for being here. You can follow Father Gerald Murray and Robert Royal's commentary at the Catholic Thing. Dot org. When we return, is traditional dating a lost art? How are young people connecting in this world of technology and social media? Boston College professor Carrie Cronin is here to talk about her new movie. It's called The Dating Project. Wait till you see this. The world over continues in a moment. What do you classify as a date? Let's go there because I don't know, months? Months? Yeah, it's been months. I've had these like random like, hey, are you around? You wanna meet me at blah, blah, blah? And I'm like, and then I happen to be free on that one night and I'm like, okay. But I don't consider that a date. I think a date is like there was some planning and there's some thought put behind it. Um, so yeah, one of those, couldn't even tell you the last one I've been on, my friend, because I have no idea. Welcome back to The World Over. That was a look at the new film, The Dating Project. It opens April 17th, featuring my next guest. She's a professor of philosophy at Boston College who found something seriously lacking in her students' lives. They're dating lives. For the first time in history, 50% of Americans are single. Now, given the hookup culture, technology, social media, have young people lost the skills necessary to date, let alone fall in love and marry? My next guest issued a challenge to students, and she's here to tell us what she discovered. Please welcome Dr. Carrie Cronin to the program. Thanks Carrie, for great having to see you. me. Okay, let's start with what we saw there. Um, <laughs> What did you discover, and why did a philosophy professor <laughs> decide, I need to help these kids in their dating lives? What were you seeing that provoked this? Well, right, about, oh, probably now 12 or 15 years ago, I had a conversation that I always connect this to years ago with a group of seniors at Boston College, which is a Jesuit Catholic university, mm -hmm. a great university. Um, and, and I was talking to these eight seniors who were just wonderful uh, go-getter types, really beautiful inside and out. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to them about life after graduation. And, and of the eight of them, only one had dated while at BC. And I thought, wow. wait, what's going on? And so the more I asked them about it, the more I heard about hookup culture and the dominance of hookup culture. Mm -hmm. And it really occurred to me that really dating scripts in our culture are sort of lost. Yeah. So I started um, assigning a date, a, a dating assignment to my uh, senior capstone class at the time. I also wow. teach freshman philosophy, a philosophy and theology course okay. uh, in the great books tradition. And so we naturally get to conversations about this. What's, right. how should you live? What's the best way to live? What's, mm -hmm. what, what is the connection between faith and reason? And so these conversations naturally Okay, arise. and the challenge was what? They had to so, go on a date, yeah. but there were prescriptions that you Absolutely. Right. demanded right. of Right, so what actually happened was the first semester that I assigned it to a group of students, a group of seniors in a mm -hmm. capstone seminar, I said, just go on a date and then come back and we'll talk about it. Well, week after week after week, they came back and they just talked about it endlessly, but they didn't go on dates. And I thought, well, I don't think they know what they're doing. So the oh next gosh. semester, I actually wrote up an assignment. And mm. the, I said to them, look, hookup culture has rules. You know what they are. Nobody's written them down, but you know what they are. You play by those rules. Mm -hmm. But dating has some really rules, some rules that are really helpful. Mm. So, so I wrote up the instructions and they really responded to that. Students, huh. the, it was like the coaching they needed, right? So yeah. the rules are things like, you know, you have to ask somebody out in person, which mm. is a huge obstacle for them. Mm -hmm. And when you ask, you should have a plan that's within three days of asking. And if you ask, you should pay. And 
you know. It couldn't be more than $10. It for the shouldn't date. be more than $10 because you don't want to signal that it's overly serious or that it's really high stakes. Boy, that really rules out stakes. dinner, I mean. <laughs> no, no, right, exactly. And I always say, oh, and it should be 60 to 90 minutes long. So I say, ah. dinner is not a good idea for a first date because mm. that is a little over serious. That's, the stakes are too high there. Mm. So I'm trying to teach them or coach them into sort of low stakes casual dating to sort of bring that back as So a why is dating so vexing for this generation? What is it? Why right. do millennials have such a problem with dating? That's a great question. I think, I mean, I think it's vexing on the one hand for all of us because it involves awkwardness and Rejection. And rejection, the possibility mm -hmm. of being rejected, mm -hmm. and and for millennials, uh, you know, I'm I'm usually talking to students at at top tier universities and colleges, mm -hmm. and these these young people work so hard, right? Yeah. In all areas of their mm -hmm. lives, they've been coached, and they're on teams, and they've been competing. They're very high achieving, mm -hmm. but as I say to them, this is the one area of your life where effort doesn't necessarily correlate with success. You know, mm. you can be your best self, you can be your most gorgeous self and have your hair just done and, and, and be interesting, and yet somebody might still say, well, not so much with uh, you, you know? Yeah. And so this is an area where they struggle because in other parts of their lives, success means they're gonna succeed. Right, effort, effort breeds success. Exactly, Here, mm. exactly. right. Here, there's a, there's a chemistry thing, there's a, there's, but you isn't know. it a cultural thing? I mean, I think of my, my children all the time in this. Isn't it a cultural moment that they're in as well that sure. is so hostile to the notion of romance? Absolutely. I mean, you know, I, I almost think, yeah. I almost feel badly for my children because we reared them in a place where people talk. I mean, we, just, we recently moved back to New Orleans, and we did that because you ha you're forced to have human interaction. People have big meals, we, we recreate together, there's music, there's dancing. Right. Other parts of the country and the world, just That's not right. done anymore. That's right. That's right. You're right. And I, I think you're pointing to something really important. On the one hand, they're living in a really intense, fast-paced mm -hmm. culture. The culture here in the U.S. is incredibly intense. So, yeah. so really, intensity is their mode, right? Mm -hmm. and, and dating takes time. It takes, it mm -hmm. takes cultivating skills of, of really letting yourself be seen by someone, the beauty of your life or the joy and the despair of your mm -hmm. life. But, and also seeing that in someone else. That's yeah. something that, that's not, it, it, you have to, you've, intimacy is sort of mundane and banal, right? And it it's, takes time. It's a, as I say to students, intimacy is, it's a, it's a road trip. It's not a quick drive, you know mm, what I mean? But, yeah. So I think you're right. It, the intensity is there for most of these young adults. But also, the lack of romance is a real problem. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I want to play something for you sure, from the please. film. Oh, yes. And this is uh, a girl from Monterey. Yes. And she's talking about just what you mentioned right. intimacy, right. touch. Watch this. My family would tell me that I'm like, like a teddy bear because I would always like go on and hug them since I was like a baby. And so, like, I came here and I just needed a hug. And so, when I was with this guy, like, I, I totally forgot on like what physical contact is and and so like he was like just touching my arm and he was like doing these and I wanted to cry like it was just so so weird um <laughs> what does that tell you it's that is such a heartbreaking scene to me, and but it, it says a lot, and it says all the sorts of things that I hear from young, young adults and college students today. That really they have deep, deep desires for connection mm -hmm. and affection, and, and to be ratified by, mm -hmm. by, by someone in this world. You know, even if you feel really loved by your family and with God, by God, you know, it's still. It's still such a deep longing in us to yeah. find someone special who really sees you yeah. and, and sees the the wonder of you. But it's fascinating to me when you read the studies. When you, well, when you read so much so much of your work, they rush to the end. They rush That's to right. the physical contact That's and right. sex. That's right. But they lack intimacy. That's exactly right. So what is that? And what is the fallout right. from that oh. juxtaposition of really uh, you know events? 
Absolutely. I, I mean, I think I think a lot of young people are sort of front loading their mm -hmm. physical mm -hmm. intimacy and and trying to let that do all the work, right? right? Of of, mm -hmm. of the kind of intimacy that demands that you show up, right, yeah. emotionally, and mm -hmm. that you that you are there for somebody else without letting your body do all the talking and making mm -hmm. all the promises. And mm -hmm. right, and I say to to young people a lot, look. What happens, some of the fallout is really dark and really dangerous. And, and some of the fallout is loneliness and anxiety and, hmm. and, and real dread about, about the possibilities of finding romance and love. But in terms of, their, in terms of sort of front-loading their physical intimacy, yeah. I often say to students, look, your bodies are saying things and making promises that you don't always mean. Mm. And then you wonder why it gets out of control and why mm -hmm. there's drama and... Yeah, and why there's hurt and pain and that exactly. hollowness after. That's yeah, right. And That's you see right. that in, in the work. What role does technology play in all of this? Oh. You would imagine because they have what we didn't have. They have Tinder, right. they have Grindr, they yeah. have Bumble, they have Frumble, they yes. have Fumble. <laughs> but right. with all of these, these uh, dating apps yes. and, and mm -hmm. dating services, Right. What's the problem? Right. You know, here's the thing about all this, all these devices and all this social media. Mm -hmm. It promises connection, right? And, mm -hmm. and in many ways, it, it does provide that. But it's a kind of a shallow connection. And I don't want to be mm -hmm. some old lady who's saying, get off your phones all the time, you know. <laughs> but, but I do point out to students, and, and a lot of us are pointing out now, the kind of connections that we get from that are not sort of life-giving, sustaining mm, kind of mm. connections. Often we're exporting our emotional lives to home and not to the people we live with or the people, mm. you know, who we're dealing with day to day mm. and the people we should be dating. Mm -hmm. So you got to learn to build your varsity team, your emotional varsity team mm -hmm. where you are, right? Yeah. And social media allows us to to sort of shuttle that out in a way. There's a little clip I want to share, and it, it came up in a discussion in the film, The Dating Project. Um, well, I'll play it, and then we can talk about okay, it. Watch great. this. Have you guys ever thought, like, would, would you guys mind if, like, your guy would watch, like, porn, porn movies? Like, would you mind or whatever he wants to do on his free time? But you wouldn't think that he's kind of cheating on you? No. Why would he be I don't cheating? know. I don't see he's not with another woman. Yeah. Yeah, but it's like portraying something that is not real. Why do you get uncomfortable it. with porn? Take it this way. You like to watch cooking shows. He likes to watch porn. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a lot of two different things. What impact does this have? I mean, I know these right. people are kind of dismissing it. Well, it's just like, you know, it's like watching a cooking show or watching Golf Channel. Right. Um, yeah. it, right. It, right. It, it seems to have far deeper impact on Absolutely. relationships and individual lives. Absolutely. I mean, I think we all know we're, we're living he, here in the United States in a highly sexualized mm -hmm. culture. And, and pornography is sort of ubiquitous. Yeah. And, and I talked to, I was just talking to a, a group of former students um, the other, a, a few weeks ago, and, and, they, and I was asking them about pornography. We were having a conversation about it. They really think it's that it's sort of morally neutral. And mm. that, and I thought, oh, I found that kind of shocking. Yeah. But then when you push in with some good questions on that, they acknowledge that it, it shapes their, mm -hmm. their imaginations about romance and love and sex. Well, expectations. And expectations. I had a student years ago who said to me, look, I love my girlfriend, but when I'm physically intimate with her, all I can imagine is the porn that I've seen. Mm. And it's really tragic and yeah. and and it's hard for them to kind of get out from under that mm. and yet in the midst of that your research reveals men more than young women crave relationships Absolutely. they crave this deep connection yeah. why is that what's I, happened to girls that's my question well yeah that's a great question so what what happened to me was that when I first started stumbled into this conversation with with young adults I, I, I didn't know that I brought with me a bias that I just assumed that, oh, guys wanted, guys, yeah, guys wanted a quick hit and, and yeah. that women really wanted to date. Right. But over the years, I've really changed my mind about that. I mm. really hear from many young men, I would really like to date, but when you ask 
a, a, a girl out, she looks at you like, what are you talking about? Are you, mm -hmm. you know, you want to get married tomorrow? I, I'm not into that. I'm, that's too intense. That too, that's too serious. And I often say to young men who will say to me, well, you know, I'll say, you're going to ask some girl out, and here's what she's going to do. She's going to say yes. She's going to look like she's a deer in headlights a little bit. She's going to say yes. And then 24 hours later, she's going to text you and say, this is just friends, right? Uh. And I'll tell you what happened. She went back and talked to 108 of her closest friends, mm -hmm. and they all weighed in about this. And they're all skittish and nervous about it. And hearing from their families, you're in college, you've got to get your career set. Mm. Don't get attached, Don't get anybody. attached. Don't get attached. Mm. But I think families don't know that if you're not getting attached, that it's not just nothing, that yeah. people aren't just opting out. This hookup scene is very dominant. It's mm -hmm. very alluring. It draws people in. Uh, well, I, I've often said it's w when you go to campuses, and you see it, you're, you live at campus. Sure. When I visit campuses, the girls now, but I don't want letters about this. I'm just speaking <laughs> truth here. <laughs> young ladies, there was a time when young women could domesticate and control the situation and <laughs> taught a boy how to become a man. Today, the culture has taught women how to become boys. Oh, interesting. That is yeah. a bad recipe. Right, right. Now the, the guardrails are off. And I think this is, then the hookup, the, you need two to tango in the hookup thing. Absolutely. And, and Absolutely. I, so that's why when I saw this research right. that young men still crave these relationships, but the women are saying, I don't want that. Right. right. And you see it, I guess I'm, I'm the cultural guy. I'm, I'm the cultural observer. Mm -hmm. I, I recently took a son to a dance. I shouldn't say this, but I will. <laughs> and I happen to peer through the door watching the kids dance. Right. They all dance in a big blob. Right. Nobody dances That's together. Right. They really just jump like That's this right. next to each other. <laughs> I said, how is this a dance? When I was dancing, hey, can you, you want to come? You want to go dance? We'll That's go dance. That's right. It was one-on-one. -on -one. Well, and, and look at that. You had to ask. Right. And that takes some social courage, right? Mm -hmm. And you learned that sometimes you get a no. And that's right. OK. And you're OK the next day about that. Yep. The ask is really important, and but to your to your earlier point, you're right. I think, I think, in our culture, it's hard to become a man, it's and not. it's hard to become a woman. Yeah, it is. We don't have a lot of help, and mm -hmm. so I think you know. And I've sometimes I go to schools, um, and and I I say if you ask somebody on a date, you pay, and and young women will mm -hmm. say to me, oh well, I don't believe in that. I really I really believe in the traditional format. And I say, well, it's not easy for you. <laughs> but here's the thing. You need to pay and you need to ask because everybody needs to be courageous in this mm. culture because uh -huh. nobody's getting any help. Mm -hmm. And we can't leave it just up to the guys. Mm -hmm. Everybody needs to step up and be courageous. But what was the result of the young people going through this traditional model of dating that you created oh, yes. for them? What was the reaction? How did it change them? Well, you know, the, the first thing I, I've noticed a lot of things over the years. I, I give this assignment every year, and I have, and, and part of the assignment is that they have to write a two to three page reflection afterwards oh. and talk to each other in class mm. about what it was like. And those are the best conversations, and I've got a, dr a locked drawer full of amazing <laughs> reflections on, on, on how nervous they were. I have this. Uh, this great young woman uh, wrote in her paper, my palms were sweating as I approached my target. And I thought, uh-oh, <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> the death they, star. I know, exactly. <laughs> they write these amazing reflections about their feelings. But they also write that, wow, people thought I was amazing. People were so impressed. My friends were so impressed that I did this. Mm -hmm. And when I brought this assignment home, the rules, all my roommates wanted to talk about it. And they wanted to try it. And I thought, Really? It was just a, a yeah. list of common sense insights. Mm -hmm. But that was one of the things that I realized after, after the mm -hmm. first semester of doing this, that the, the greatest thing about the dating assignment for me wasn't necessarily that 15 or 25 students were going on dates, though that's wonderful, yep. and I've been to a wedding that came out oh, of it. Great. But the best thing is that it got students talking to each other uh -huh. about it and about what they really long for and what they fear. Given all of this, what would be your advice to parents of high schoolers and college kids. Yes. What should they be doing to help their young person go out and find 
the, right. the person they were intended to be with and build a life with them? That's a great question. First, they should go see the movie. And, yeah. and I'll tell you, I, 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 this movie, I was, when they called me to say, would you be part of this? I thought, oh, these people are crazy. I'm not going to do this. <laughs> but they did such a beautiful job. It's yeah. so story it driven. Yeah. And I think it's a great movie that you could watch with your kids mm -hmm. and talk about. And, and young people could watch with each other and really mm -hmm. talk about productively. But one thing that I've often recommended to, to parents is talk about the relationships that didn't work out. Most of mm -hmm. us talk about spouses or partners, mm -hmm. the, the relationship that did work out. Right. But most of us don't talk about our dating foibles and adventures and the one that got away mm -hmm. or the, the one I wished I had asked out when I was 16, but mm -hmm. I didn't. I think, I think those conversations help young people. Yeah. I think they want to hear about our successes and our failures, and they want to they hear that you get through it and you'll be fine. Now, and Carrie, this is the final question. Okay. I've saved probably the most difficult for life. Oh, my. <laughs> you are the dating doctor. <laughs> That's crazy. And yet, you're single. I am. Now, yes. And, and what, what yes. has this reshaped the way you approach yes dating yeah. or engage possible dates. Absolutely. You know, I, I always say to students, look, I'm talking to you about dating and I'm not married, so maybe I'm not very good at this, but I'm old and I still have to think about it, right? <laughs> I have to think about this. Mm -hmm. Most of your, you know, your parents and your aunts and uncles, mostly they did this year Out ago. of the game for they, 25 yeah, years. exactly. Yeah. So they don't know. I'm I'm in this with you. I know mm -hmm. that I'm asking you to do something really difficult. Mm -hmm. I know that I'm asking you to risk feeling awkward and risk rejection because I have to do that too. Mm -hmm. So, but but we all need to be brave. We mm -hmm. all need to to try. You 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 try, and if it doesn't work, you dust yourself off. You find a good friend mm -hmm. to eat some ice cream with, and you get back <laughs> out there. And you you say it's really about social courage. It is more than anything else. It is. Very good. Excellent. The film is fantastic. Thank, Thank you, you for so coming much. in. And remember, The Dating Project featuring Boston College professor Dr. Kerry Cronin opens Tuesday, April 17th for one night only in select theaters. Go to thedatingprojectmovie.com. Tickets are available now for screenings in your area. Don't forget, Will Wilder 2, The Lost Staff of Wonders is out in paperback now with a special preview chapter of Will Wilder 3. I'll tell you what that is in a few weeks. Go to willwilderbooks.com or the EWTN Religious Catalog, Amazon, independent booksellers, wherever books are sold for your copy. That is all the time we have now. Until next week, the show continues on Facebook and Twitter. Follow me on Twitter. You can like me on Facebook. The links are at RaymondArroyo.com. Be sure to join us next week. Academy Award-winning director of The Exorcist, William Friedkin, joins us to talk about his newest film, The Devil and Father Amorth. Don't miss this. Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thanks for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo from Washington, D.C. Bye now.